All right, welcome back to Immunology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and make sure to like this and subscribe. All right, so we've been talking about, in the past few videos, the three pathways of complement activation. All right, I want to mention one thing real quick before we do this topic. All right, let me find a good picture. Here's a good picture. This is just an example. All right, this, this is actually uh, the C3 convertase that we have in both the lectin pathway and classical pathways of complement activation. Um, we have C3 convertase right here, and it's going to split a protein called C3 into two components, C3B and C3A. Generally, when we talk about this, the A component floats away, the B component remains bound to the pathogen or whatever it is that we're attacking. Okay. The point is the A component floats away. And in general, um, the B components remain bound. Those, are gonna, those were the subjects of what we were talking about. Those are what facilitate the formation of the membrane attack complex. And we pretty much just said the A components float away, and we didn't talk about them. But it's not like those components are useless. In fact, they're very important. Um, the, our cells are going to make use of every component. The B components help form the membrane attack complex. The A components are what we call anaphylatoxins. Okay? What an anaphylatoxin is, is it's something that basically is going to promote inflammation. And this is a summary slide right here of the three primary anaphylatoxins, C3A, C5A, and C4A. Now, I will say this. We don't really consider C4A because although it can act as an anaphylatoxin, um, it's by far the weakest of those three. I will also say C5A is the strongest. It has the highest, uh, it has the highest biological activity of all three of these, but C4A we really don't talk about because it really doesn't have much activity. It's very weak as an anaphylatoxin. And in general, these proteins, specifically C3A and C5A, are going to do a few things. Um, number one, uh, particularly C5A, because it is the strongest, and with C3A, what they're going to do is they're going to act as chemoattractants. They're going to promote chemotaxis of white blood cells. So, for example, neutrophils. So what is chemotaxis? Well, if I have got a cell, and if you kind of just imagine a cell as, say, just imagine it as a circle. So imagine a circle in your mind. Just imagine it. Now imagine on the circle, there's a bunch of C5A and C3A just around the top of it. Okay, just around the top. Not on any other side of the circle or any other part, just around the top. Well, if there's a higher concentration of these anaphylatoxins on the top, then the anaphylatoxins must be coming from that area, so that means the white blood cell is going to move up because it's going to go where the anaphylatoxins are being generated, which means that's where the pathogen is. If you imagine the same circle and say those anaphylatoxins were on the left side of the circle, then they're going to attract that white blood cell to move to the left. Um, if you have the same circle and the uh, anaphylatoxins are on the bottom only, they're highly concentrated on the bottom of the circle, then that probably means the, the pathogen is on the bottom side and the circle is going to move down. Um, it's Now, in all reality, these white blood cells are not really circles. They're not even really spherical, but you get the point. Whatever side of the, whatever part of the cell on the outside the anaphylatoxins are more highly concentrated, that's going to kind of indicate which direction the white blood cells should move, and that's the principle of chemotaxis. Okay? That's what these anaphylatoxins do. They're generated from the area where the pathogen is, and so they're going to direct the white blood cells to move to that area so they can help clean up the mess and kill the pathogen, because neutrophils are very effective phagocytes. Okay? Now, speaking of phagocytosis, um, C3A and C5A are also going to enhance phagocytosis. They're going to act as opsonins. All right, now this, this is a little misleading. Um, we have another video where I talk about opsonization, 
it's not actually C3A and C5A that are acting as opsonins. What an opsonin does basically is it enhances phagocytosis in some way. Um, the typical meaning of opsonin is the opsonin is, is going to bind to the, the phagocyte and that's going to facilitate the phagocytosis. Um, C, that's usually done by C3B. Um, C3A and C5A are going to do this in a little bit of a different way. But particularly C5A, what C5A is going to do is it's going to upregulate a protein on phagocytes called integrin. And this integrin is going to allow the phagocyte to adhere a lot more effectively to uh, the vessel wall. And so what that's going to do is it's going to allow, allow the phagocyte to stick on the vessel wall for more time basically and allow it to get and phagocytize more of the pathogen versus if it didn't stick well it's not going to be able to phagocytize, phagocytize as much foreign material okay so C5A in, in particular is just going to cause upregulation of integrin not only that these two anaphylatoxins will also upregulate lipoxygenase pathway enzymes and also enzymes in, in generally involved in arachidonic acid metabolism such as the prostaglandin and thromboxane synthesis enzymes. Okay, so for example cyclooxygenases and um, thromboxane synthase. Okay, but the, op the actual opsonization is more done by C3B but C3A and C5A do enhance the phagocytosis from the perspective that they upregulate the integrin, allowing it to stick on vessel walls a little better. Okay. Now, another thing they do is they're very strongly able to cause degranulation of mast cells. Now, first of all, what is a mast cell? A mast cell is a white blood cell that contains these sacs or granules that contain a lot of histamine. Histamine is um, a molecule that is derived from histidine, the amino acid, and histamine is able to, number one, promote blood vessel vasodilation and also increased vascular permeability. We'll talk about that in a minute. But C3A and C5A are able to cause degranulation, meaning those granules are dumped out and the histamine is released into the systemic circulation. Now, what the release of histamine does is it causes vasodilation. Well, if you've got an affected area that is, you know, like say, say you have a blood vessel injury, you have an, an external injury, you start bleeding, that means you could have foreign invasion of pathogens, right? So maybe it would be very important right there to, in that particular area, get some white blood cells there to hold off the bacteria so they don't infiltrate too much. Well, histamine promotes vasodilation in that area, which means increasing the blood vessel diameter, increasing blood flow, which consequently, consequently means you allow more blood white blood cells to that area. The increased vascular permeability means that you have these in blood vessels, they're, the walls have fenestrations, meaning they're not completely solidified, um, they have little gaps. But when we say increased vascular permeability, um, those blood vessel fenestrations widen and allow more white blood cells to get into the area, meaning they can leak out of the blood vessels into the interstitial areas to help clean up the mess, kill foreign invaders. If you've got foreign material that you don't want, they'll help phagocytize that as well. Okay, so the point is, it's not like these A components of the complement proteins do nothing. It's not like we just clip them off and they're just trash. No, we make use of them. They're anaphylatoxins. They promote inflammation by degranulating mast cells. They act as chemoattractants and attract neutrophils to the area to help clean up the mess. And then also, indirectly, they do promote opsonization. They help the, back, the phagocytes adhere to the, um, the vessel walls, which is going to allow them to get in the area and be able to phagocytize more material. All right, so hopefully this gave you some intuition on these anaphylatoxins. Make sure to like this video and subscribe um, for future videos. In the next video in the playlist, we'll go over the types of opsonization. We have direct and indirect. What is the difference between the two? Join us for that. Thank you.